Dr. Shantano, thank you very much for your time. It's a great honor to have you on our program. So first of all, could I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yes, well, my name is Sean Turnell, and uh, up until a few years ago, I was a professor in economics in Australia. Uh, but in 2016, I came over here since then and living up here in Napidor. So I would like to drive straight into what's been unfolding, unfolding on, the, on the Western Front with the uh, Rakhine crisis. Mm. So what's your opinion? Yeah, indeed. Well, and, and as you identified, the first thing to say is that the Rakhine crisis has been a tragedy and that there have been perpetrators behind that, and they ultimately need to be brought to justice. But around this issue too has been a profound lack of understanding of the complexity of the issue, and I think verging at times on, on fake news, as you mentioned. Um, I've been very critical, observing here from Napidor, of particularly the international press reaction. I think there have been many vested interests within the international press and elsewhere at seeing the situation in, in very stark and unrealistic terms, very black and white terms. And it's meant that I think the coverage has in large part been incredibly counterproductive. A lot of people tend to believe what is being uh, said in the, in the media. And I think the biggest single problem here is a willful lack of understanding of the role of the civilian government. I think for many people outside, the cheap and sexy story has been the idea of a new government seeking democracy, led by a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, being associated with violence, and we see the word genocide and so on thrown around. When you think about it, that's a, that's a clickbait story. That's something that people pay attention to. It's a much sexier story. The real tragedy of that, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's undermined the very real efforts to try and bring a solution to Rakhine and try to bring peace. Yeah, so talking about vested interests, uh, the, the people who are behind it, the entities that are behind it, uh, what sort of benefit do they get driving this? There are quite a lot of people, both within Myanmar and outside of it, that would like to see this experiment in democracy fail. A lot of the vested interests in politics, in the security apparatus, in economics. And in doing that, whenever you're a reformist government, you run into an enemy. So in many ways, I think many of us in on the reformist wing, if you like, of the civilian government, we always expected something, some pushback. And Rakhine has succeeded very greatly to that end. Because, you know, I, while the civilian government has tried to stay on track, in the economic sphere particularly they have, but nonetheless Rakhine has been, I think, a major effort to derail that process. And, you know, again, in other ways I think it succeeded, and certainly internationally, the, the brand, if you like, of Myanmar has been really damaged by what has taken place and the reaction to it. So I think it is important to identify that, you know, again, there are interests in this country as well as outside who want to see this new experiment in democracy in a country that has been ridden by conflict and oppression for 60 years, wanting to see that fail. Perhaps, you know, you can touch on the, the various uh, complexities, uh, because complexities is one of the things they talk about. Yeah, certainly I think the complexities are everywhere around this issue. There are domestic complexities to do with great historical rights and wrongs in Rakhine State and other places. There are the complexities I mentioned earlier about vested interests in the economy who want to see the reform effort fail. Internationally, there are extraordinary complexities. This is, the whole Rakhine issue is caught up in geopolitics. It's caught up in things like, I think, identity politics. It's caught up with the great struggle between uh, civilizational groups, if you like, around the world. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a deeply complex story, uh, but it's not allowed that that complexity doesn't seem to get across. And therefore, the solutions that, you know, need to be complex themselves in dealing with a situation that is not as black and white as people think uh, sometimes gets lost. Yeah, uh, there, there is a lot of criticism against Do Aung San Suu Kyi, for example, about her keeping silent. Yep. So what's your opinion there? Yeah, sometimes a lie, if repeated enough, becomes a truth. And one of the most central in this whole drama, I think, has been the idea that Dora Aung San Suu Kyi has not spoken out. It's just simply not true. I mean, she's spoken out again and again against the violence in Rakhine State and other 
conflicts in Myanmar and said that this is completely unacceptable, that somehow she's not speaking up has become sort of part of the established myth, I think, uh, around Rakhine. So, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is that the civilian government has been trying to do a great many things to try and solve the situation of the violence in Rakhine and other places as well. Very specifically, in terms of you know the actual violence that's taking place in the immediate sense, but then longer term, trying to chip away through reform of Myanmar's political economy against this entire state apparatus that again for 50 to 60 years has used oppression and violence to keep the people of Myanmar under control. But by trying to chip away at that, by going deep into the political economy, trying to open things up, open Myanmar up to the world, they're actually trying to bring about the sort of peaceful institutional framework that the country needs. So in really profound ways, uh, Dorsu and the civilian government more broadly, is really trying to come up with solutions to this very intractable problem. Dr. Shantano, thank you very much for your time. It's a great honour to have you on our programme. By looking into improving the economy, so it's by uh, lifting up poverty, uh, it would uh, lead towards peace uh, for the country. Yeah. I, I think it's safe to say that not all conflict, of course, is economic based, but an awful lot of it is. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have the veneer of religious conflict or ideological conflict, but mm -hmm. you go one step below that, and it yeah. very often is a mm -hmm. fight over resources, a fight over mm -hmm. economics. And I think that's highly relevant when we look at Rakhine State, because mm -hmm. again, the complexities come in. Rakhine is very, very poor. Most people in Rakhine are poor. And so the real thing to do is to try and aim at real solutions. How can we help the people of Rakhine? What can we do in really fundamental ways to bring about the end to violence, the end to conflict? What sort of um, real efforts do you see with regard to bringing back the displaced and getting them resettled? Well, I think uh, bringing people back remains the absolute objective of the civilian government. It was central to the Kofi Annan report, um, but they're trying to do it properly. They want to try and make sure that the situation is such that people can safely return. The worst thing in the world you could do would be to bring people back prematurely into a situation that could just expose them to more violence. So getting it right is the critical thing. And it seems to me, again, that you know the, the senior ministers and the senior people within the civilian government, that's what they're trying to do. But there are many forces against them. Uh, mm -hmm. all over the place, both within this country and outside. Uh, many people who uh, gained from the initial violence, of course, will gain from continuing violence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the risks are all over the place. Uh, but it seems to me this is why that a very careful approach to bringing people back is exactly what's needed. And I think that's the approach being undertaken. So can you talk about how the economy can be improved in Rakhine State? The first thing to say is that I think that the economy in Rakhine State, and indeed the whole country, was left in a dreadful state when the NLD came to office in March 2016. But open in various ways to these various crony cohorts. But for the average person, they had no power at all. They had very often great difficulty in earning a living. So apart from just getting the economy back to, to growing, the biggest objective of the government was to try and transform that political economy, give opportunities not just to the cronies but to other people. So open up the markets, expand access to credit, expand access to international trade, try to bring the average person of Myanmar people with ideas, particularly young people with ideas and energy, trying to allow them to get the opportunities that they need and deserve. This is why some of these actors, I think we really need to investigate uh, and need just to think about how a lot of these vested interests are behind a lot of the pushback against the reforms uh, and behind a lot of the violence that I think in their minds might be useful in pushing back against the objectives of the government in trying to make a more open economy to the average person. Yeah, the pushback, I guess you're saying, not only the Rakhine, but also perhaps the ethnic problem as well, isn't it? 
there's just a broad struggle in Myanmar across the mm -hmm. board. And in that way, Myanmar resembles many other countries making this very, very difficult transition, again, for five, six decades into something else. You'll always confront vested interests. Uh, it's a long, difficult struggle in which profound institutional change is required. So it's a, it's a big struggle. Uh, and it's going to make a lot of enemies along the way. Uh, it's going to make, I think, the bulk of people much better off. But at the same time, there are going to be a small cohort of people who benefited under the old regimes who are going to be discomforted. And they're not slow in demonstrating that and their unhappiness and then acting on that to push back, as I say, against the reforms. Mm -hmm. There are also uh, observations that talk about the way it is moving forward. And some, of, some people are saying that they are actually surprised by the advance and the development. Is that true in your observation? Again, I think the narrative that has been established is one of economic underperformance. Uh, and I think much of the press reportage, but you look at the numbers, and in fact, it's not true. So right at this point, for instance, Myanmar is the second fastest growing economy in Asia. And given that Asia is far and away the fastest growing region of the world, Myanmar is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. In fact, it's in the top 10 of fast growing economies. So, you know, there's been extraordinary progress uh, to that end. But again, as I mentioned earlier, extraordinary progress in structural reform trying to open up the different markets, trying to expand access. Because in the end, that's what it's really about, allowing people access to improve their own circumstances. That's really the major goal of economic reform, mm -hmm. not only in Myanmar, but everywhere where it's attempted. Yeah. And I think I really want to end my interview on that very high positive note. So, Dr. Sean Turnell, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.